over there. All right. Well, it's good to be with you once again. And I'd like you, please, if you would, turn in your Bibles to the book of Genesis. And uh, this time we're going to be looking at chapter 26. We're continuing our little study meditation on the wells of Scripture. And uh, this is our second study. And we want to think about Isaac, uh, the man of the wells, particularly um, this evening. So I'm going to read from chapter 26 of Genesis, verse 12. And I will read down to verse 25, Genesis 26, verse 12, down to verse 25. So it begins this way. It says, then Isaac sowed in that land and received in the same year an hundredfold, and the Lord blessed him. And the man waxed great and went forward and grew until he became very great. For he had possession of flocks and possession of herds and great store of servants, and the Philistines envied him. For all the wells which his father's servants had digged in the days of Abraham, his father, the Philistines had stopped them and filled them with earth. And Abimelech said unto Isaac, Go from us, for thou art much mightier than we. And Isaac departed thence and pitched his tent in the valley of Gerar and dwelt there. And Isaac digged again the wells of water, which they had digged in the days of Abraham, his father. For the Philistines had stopped them after the death of Abraham. And he called their names after the names by which his father had called them. And Isaac's servants digged in the valley and found there a well of springing water. And the herdsmen of Gerar did strive with Isaac's herdsmen, saying, The water is ours. And he called the name of the well Esek, because they strove with him. And they digged another well and strove for that also. He called the name of it Sitna. And he removed from thence and digged another well. And for that they strove not. And he called the name of it Rehoboth. And he said, For now the Lord hath made room for us, and we shall be fruitful in the land. And he went up from thence to Beersheba, and the Lord appeared unto him that same night, and said, I am the God of Abraham, thy father. Fear not, for I am with thee, and will bless thee, and multiply thy seed for my servant Abraham's sake. And he builded an altar there, and called upon the name of the Lord, and pitched his tent there, and there Isaac's servants digged a well. And again, God will bless that reading of his word to us this evening. Now, we realize that water is an essential of life. Physical life depends upon it. Therefore, water is also used in scripture as a picture of something even more significant, ingredients of the spiritual life that are essential. And we mentioned last time that two of the illusions or illustrations that water is used to depict is the work of the Holy Spirit, which again is essential, uh, and also the work of the scriptures. And I want to just again remind us of some of the pertinent references that link water to these things. And so we'll start in the Old Testament with the book of Isaiah, and just kind of a little bit of background before we jump into our passage. Isaiah 44, 3, it says, for I will pour water upon him that is thirsty, and floods upon the dry ground. And then it says, I will pour my spirit upon thy seed and my blessing upon thine offspring. So there you get a definite link between water upon dry, thirsty ground and the spirit coming upon your seed, upon your offspring. So water, again, a symbol of the spirit. Uh, and probably the, one of the most obvious ones is in John 7. And we'll be coming back here later on today. But in John 7, 37, uh, where the Lord Jesus it says, in the last day, the great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried, said, if any man thirst, let him come to me and drink. He that believes on me, as the scripture hath said, out of his belly or his innermost being shall flow rivers of living water. But this spake he of the spirit, which they that believe on him should receive. For the Holy Ghost was not yet given because that Jesus was not yet glorified. And so uh, the clear connection between the spirit and water in terms of an analogy, a picture, essential for physical life, essential for spiritual life. If you don't have the spirit, you're none of it, right? It's, it's just an evident fact. And then the word of God 
is also linked to the Holy Spirit. We know this verse well, Ephesians 5 and verse 26, Ephesians chapter 5, verse 26, where we see a connection between the, the water and the word of God. It says in verse 25, husbands love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word so again the word of god is connected with water and of course essential to spiritual life faith comes by hearing hearing by the word of god you're born again not of uh, corruptible seed but incorruptible by the word of god that lives and abides forever both essential ingredients to spiritual life and actually both of them lead us to the same place and that is to the person of christ you search the scriptures the Lord said to the Pharisees, for in them you think you have eternal life, but these are they which testify of me. And so Christ, of course, is the, the, the person that really brings refreshment. And so the Spirit of God and the Word of God direct us to him. Because the Spirit of God in John 16, 13, and 14, he said he's not going to speak of himself, but he shall glorify me. And so both the ministry of the Word and the ministry of the Spirit are both going in the same direction to point to the person in this barren, dry, thirsty world to the one place that they'll find satisfaction and lasting joy, and that's the person of the Lord Jesus. And so word and spirit are so essential. And of course, we know that uh, the false teachers in the book of Jude, it says, having not the spirit, <laughs> uh, not only did they corrupt the word of God, they didn't have the spirit. And so we can see wells were vitally important from a, from a life-giving perspective for the country of Israel. Uh, the only rivers in Israel being the Jordan and the Yarmuk and the Jabbok rivers. Uh, and so uh, basically very little for, for quite a, a, a spread of land, very little by way of natural uh, water from rivers. And so they were very dependent on wells. Uh, there were brooks that came up in the rainy season, uh, but they dried up for five months in the, in the blazing summer heat. And so you couldn't depend on them. So you desperately needed wells. And so the water supply was essential uh, to be able to water their flocks, to be able to irrigate their land and for crops. And of course, these wells were dug by hand. And they were deep. Uh, some of them, you, you had to go down a long way. You go to Israel, you've been a, if you've ever been there, you go to Jacob's well, uh, the supposed site. And, it, it, the well, and the Lord said, right, the well is deep. Or the woman of Samaria said, the well is deep. And so some of these wells were, were really quite deep. And um, one of the problems was you didn't want them to get contaminated because if the water supply got contaminated, instead of giving life, it would bring death. And so usually around the top of the, the well, uh, they would build a rim around it, and then they put a stone on the top of it uh, to keep the water from being contaminated and to keep it pure so that it could have its desired effects when it was needed. And so often these wells became places of contention because whoever owned the well, you know, had basically the right to water the land. And so often you see contention uh, going on there as well. Of course, in our Bibles, um, and we're just doing a bit of an overview to begin with, but so many significant meetings occurred at wells because it was part of the daily routine. You know, for us, uh, we just go to the faucet, we turn on the, 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 the faucet and water's there. We've got indoor plumbing for them, you know, and all this, all the luxuries of that. But it, still in many places in the world today, that's not the case. And so if they want water, which they need to survive, they have to make trips daily to the well uh, or to a water pump or whatever. And that was uh, certainly the case in Bible times. And that's where a lot of significant meetings occurred. Moses was introduced to his, the family of Jethro and his future father-in-law in Exodus 2 at a well. Abraham's servant found Rebekah in Genesis 24 at a well. Uh, Genesis 29, Jacob meets Rachel there, uh, possibly at the very same well. And then, of course, we know that a greater than our father Jacob uh, met that woman of Samaria at the well of Sychar. 
And so we just see this kind of constant idea that it was a place of great significance uh, when um, there was a defense of a city. Uh, for instance, one of the things that Hezekiah did um, when uh, the Assyrians were coming, uh, he stopped up the wells outside the city so that they would not have a water source. He had one in the city, but for the enemy, they didn't want him to have any water. So just having said all that, we see how important it is. Now, as we look at our passage, I want to just make some general remarks about the patriarchs. And as we think about the patriarchs, Abraham, if you want to do a study of Abraham, one of the things you find about Abraham was he was the man of the altars. And so a good study of Abraham, you would look at the altars in Abraham's life and it would tell the story. Jacob was the man of the pillars. And so he's a guy who keeps erecting pillars. And Isaac is the man of the wells. That's what he's known for. He's known for wells. Now, what's interesting about Isaac is that there's very little written about Isaac on his own. He's always written about in connection with somebody else. So when Abraham goes up Mount Moriah to offer Isaac, his son. So, right. So kind of, it's really Abraham's the main person in the story. Uh, his sons, uh, all his dealings with Jacob and Esau, you know, again, uh, it's not really Isaac on his own, even Genesis 24, uh, finding a bride for Isaac, but it's really the servant and, and Rebecca, that's the star of the, the whole story, really. And so uh, Isaac really is not very prominent. And actually, this chapter, chapter 26, is the one chapter that we get a glimpse of the man Isaac, perhaps more clearly, without his connection with Abraham or Jacob and Esau, but on his own. This is the man Isaac. Uh, this is the chapter where we find him uh, on his own. And so it's, it's very fascinating to consider him. And I, I said that he's definitely the man of the wells. In fact, after he comes, uh, after the incident on Mount Moriah, uh, where he's offered up there, um, we notice <clears throat> that the next time that we see him uh, mentioned um, is in connection with a well. And that is, if you look at uh, Genesis 24 and verse 62, it says, and Isaac came from the way of the well, Le Lahiroi, for he dwelt in the south country. That's Genesis 24, verse 62. So when he comes to meet Rebecca, where is he coming from? He's coming uh, from the well, Lahiroi, which means the well of the living one that seeth me. And uh, again, uh, we see him in chapter 25, and we'll, we'll notice in verse 11, where he's living in and it says, it came to pass after the death of Abraham that God blessed his son Isaac, and Isaac dwelt by the well Lahiroi. So he's, he's always in connection with wells. You just see this consistently, you know, after, um, uh, after Mount Moriah, he's always connected with wells. In fact, there are seven mentions with him in connection to wells. Uh, so clearly, he is the man of the wells. So he was in this place of privilege, uh, the well of him that seeth me, the God that sees me, but then he leaves. And chapter 26 is where we're going to be spending the rest of our time. But notice uh, what happens in chapter 26. It says there was a famine in the land beside the first famine that was in the days of Abraham. And Isaac went to Abimelech, king of the Philistines, unto Gerar. And the Lord appeared to him and said, in verse 2, go not down into Egypt, dwell in the land which I shall tell thee of, sojourn in this land, and I'll be with thee and will bless thee. For unto thee and unto thy seed I will give all these countries, and I'll perform the oath which I swear to Abraham thy father. So just like Abraham, there was a famine in the land. And his, he very much like father, like son. When, when there was a famine in the land, Abraham went into Egypt. And we learned last week that was not a good move for Abraham, right? Went into Egypt. Uh, Lot got a taste for Sodom. He picked up a maid servant there. Lots of consequences of that. And I believe that Isaac would have done exactly the same thing had not the Lord appeared to him and told him, go not down to Egypt. 
because he's acting just the way his father did in many different ways, not just the fact that he's heading and Gerar's right on the border of Egypt, right? It's kind of headed south in the land of Israel, just on the border of Egypt. So that's where he was headed. And it was only the fact that the Lord stopped him that prevented him from going there. And then when he got there, of course, to this land of Gerar, it's the land of the Philistines. It's a borderland. And it was a land that was under the control of the Philistines. And what does he do? Well, like father, like son, when Abraham went into Egypt, what did he do about his beautiful wife, Sarah? He lied and said, she is my sister. So what does Isaac do? Well, when he goes into the land here um, of the Philistines, he also lies about Rebecca because she was another beautiful woman. And he said, she's my sister. And so isn't it interesting that there is a tendency for family propensities. You just notice that, you know, uh, the sin nature is passed down from father to son anyway, but, but you also can see similar propensities. And that's the thing to be careful of, isn't it? That we, uh, that we learn from the mistakes of our fathers and not repeat them. But certainly we, we see here that he's doing exactly the same thing that his father had done before him. And Abraham, although he's a great man of faith, uh, his lapse into Egypt set a pretty bad example that, that, that left an impression. Uh, and certainly uh, it, it, the story of it, although he, uh, Isaac wasn't present, but the story of it kind of obviously stuck in his mind. Now he's in the same scenario and he seeks to do the very same things. And so he goes to this place called Gerar, and uh, moving away from this place of the well where the Lord sees me, this place of blessing, going to this borderland area, which where, where the Philistines were living. But the Lord blessed him, perhaps partly because of the covenant he'd made with Abraham, partly because uh, he had obeyed and not gone down to Egypt. And he's blessed in a remarkable way. In verse 12, he sows in the land and receives the same year a hundredfold, and the Lord blessed him. Interesting that he's the only patriarch that's ever mentioned in terms of sowing grain. The other patriarchs just had cattle. There's no mention of them sowing grain. This is the only reference to the patriarch sowing grain. But he was very successful. And he got the maximum harvest. If you remember the parable of the sower and the Lord Jesus, when he talks about the greatest amount, he said some a hundredfold and some 60 and some 40, right? So 100 was max, maximum yield. And so he got the maximum yield. And the result of that was, it tells us in verse 13, the man waxed great and went forward and grew until he became very great. So he's really prospering. And a man's greatness is to do in uh, his glory, if you like, in the Old Testament sense was to do with all the stuff that he had. So he's got all this, this abundance of crops and servants and, and all the rest of it. And so it said, verse 14, he had possession of flocks, possession of herds, great store of servants, and the Philistines envied him. It's amazing how envy has such an impact on the story of the Bible. In fact, I'm amazed that I have not heard more messages on the crippling sin of envy. You think of Joseph. Why was he sold into Egypt? Well, his brethren were moved with envy. Why was the Lord Jesus crucified? Uh, quite clear, Pontius Pilate understood why, that they had handed him over because of envy. And envy is devastating. And the, the Lord's people, and especially the more carnal amongst the Lord's people, Envy can be a real snare. You could envy a person's gift. You could envy a person's kind of respect that he has amongst the assemblies. You could envy uh, what a person, maybe a person's a very good steward of his finances. And not that he's earning more than you are, but he's, he's doing a better job of managing them. And you could be crippled with envy. And we, we've got to watch the crippling sin of envy. It really is devastating. And so they, they, Philistines, are envious of this man. He's being blessed and clearly being blessed of God. And they're envious of it and it's eaten away at them. And so it tells us that part of their response to this, uh, 
was well they didn't like him around for sure but notice it it says uh, verse 15 for all the wells which the his father's servants had digged in the days of abraham his father the philistines had stopped them and filled them with earth Again, this is pretty devastating, isn't it? I mean, if wells are such a source of life, to fill them with dirt and block them up is a very negative thing to do. And, and certainly that is what the Philistines were guilty of. And so we need to just think a little bit about who the Philistines are. What do they really typify? Because all of Israel's enemies picture something. For instance, we know clearly in scripture, Amalek is a type of the flesh. It's a very clear type of the flesh. It says the Lord will always have war with, with Amalek. So he'll always have war with the flesh. By the way, I'm so glad it's the Lord will always have war. The battle's the Lord's, not mine. The Lord will always have war with Amalek. And so that's one example. So the Philistines also picture something typically. So who are they? Well, they're in the land of Israel, but they're not part of the people of God and have not had the same experience as the people of God. They didn't cross the Red Sea. They didn't cross the Jordan. In fact, they came from Greece, actually, their, their Greek background, and they migrated in through Egypt, just like the children of Israel, and they came down into the land, uh, but they didn't belong there. They weren't native to the land, but they, they had taken the part of the land for themselves, were going to constantly be an enemy of God's people, and so they're in the place, I would suggest to you, the type for us as Christians is this. They represent unconverted people who are in the place of Christian profession. Okay? Unconverted people who are in the place of Christian profession. So they're in the land of promise, the place of blessing, supposedly. But they've not had the experience of being redeemed by blood. They've not had the experience of crossing the red sea and crossing jordan so they're they're amongst god's people but they've not had the same experience they're right there amongst them they're in the land they're in the place of, of blessing but they have not had the experience and so they represent unregenerate men who occupy ground that belongs to the people of god and again i've just been shocked as i've studied this and meditated on it this afternoon but i'm seeing the parable of the sower all through this chapter and I'm not sure when the Lord gave that parable, if he had Genesis 26 in his mind, perhaps he did, but you have a hundredfold in his sowing. And now one of the things the Lord said is that in, in his parables that he taught in Matthew 13 was that while men slept, Satan sowed so tares among the wheat. They looked like wheat. They were right among the wheat, but they had no fruit. They weren't genuine wheat and and it's only when they fully grew that you'd see they looked like even as they were growing they looked very similar but when you get to there was no fruit there was no grain and so that's who these philistines typify they certainly had not had the experiences of the people of god so they represent unbelievers who've taken up a pos position in the professing church and they remain there as liberals as unbelievers holding on to things to which they have no right in opposing the true saints of God. And part of the thing about a Philistine is he has different appetites to the true child of God. He's not interested in the, the living water that speaks of Christ. That doesn't, that's not something that captivates him. And so <clears throat> what's also fascinating is just as so false professors like the tares are going to be left amongst us. <laughs> and sadly, it's true. That, um, um, I think even in our assemblies, I've preached in assemblies and given gospel messages and people who people thought were saved, got saved through the preaching of the gospel. And everybody was shocked. I even know a man who was an elder who was unconverted and he was an elder in an assembly and a conservative assembly at that. And it was only later in that he realized he, he wasn't saved. And so it's possible, and Judas amongst the 12, right? It's possible to be a pretty good tear that looks like the real thing. In fact, if we were judging the 12, I tell you what we would have done. We would have said that Peter 
if anybody's a tear, it's Peter, because he denied the Lord with oaths and cursings. But when they said, one of you will betray me, not one of them said, oh, we know who that is. That's Judas. No, no, no. They said, is it I? He was, he carried it off. I mean, nobody had a clue. And so that's who these Philistines really are. People who like liberal theologians, uh, they've crept into the church. Uh, they seize positions that belong to God's people and they are always devastating. And so what we find is that they, they, they block up the wells. We'll think more about that in a moment. Look at verse 18. So Isaac digged again the wells of water, which they had digged in the days of Abraham, his father. And the Philistines had stopped them after the death of Abraham. And he called their names after the names by which his father had called them. So we find that Isaac has to dig the wells afresh. And I suggest to you that each new generation has to dig deep to get spiritual refreshment from the word of God and find Christ to be real to their own hearts. You, you, you can't, in a sense, you can, you can do everything you can to pass on the truth to your children, but there comes a point when it has to become their own and they have to learn to dig it out themselves and they have to learn to enjoy that living water for themselves. And it's a wonderful thing when that happens. Uh, I know since James has been in Norway, it's just been an interesting experience because he's been challenged constantly about New Testament truth, which he's known all his life. And so he's had to go through and study it himself. And when he discovers it himself, it's all the more precious to him. Not that he's ever had questioned it, but now it's, it's real to him and he's having to defend it and he's having to dig it out himself and he's finding it to be absolutely precious to his soul. And so that's, I think that's a good way that we should think about that. Each new generation has to dig deep to get spiritual refreshment from the word of God, to get it pure. Often we have to clear away that which has contaminated it. All that dirt that was put in has to be cleaned out. And so often you see the enemy loves to cloud up the truth of the word of God. He uses traditions. Uh, he, he uses uh, liberal theologians and higher criticism, and he uses theistic evolution and all kinds of things to, to somehow muddy the waters. And we've got to dig out the dirt and get to the pure pure meat of the word of God or that living, pure living water, get back to the pure, clean source, remove traditions that have blocked the flow. And so Isaac's action symbolizes, in a sense, the rediscovery of truth concerning Christ in a fresh way. Uh, and of course, sadly, we've seen in church history, there's been times like this where there's been a redigging of the wells. It, it, the Reformation, what, why was that necessary? Because all the Philistines in the, the, the visible church had so clouded up the truth of the, the simple gospel and the person of Christ with all this clutter uh, of, of centuries, tradition upon tradition, that men like Luther had to dig the wells again, you see, and find the truth of the, the simple new testament the just shall live by faith and when he did it was like it was like a an, an arrow to his soul it was refreshing it was that war that he needed and then i believe in the early 1800s when people discovered again the truth of the fact that uh, there there is that blessed hope for the church, the rapture, uh, the truth of gathering to the name of the Lord Jesus alone, the, the, the truths of seeing a distinction between Israel and the church that had been lost. And this truth became precious to a new generation. And so every generation has to somehow rediscover the truth, get rid of the, the baggage, the clutter, the, the Philistine dirt that has somehow obscured that living water. And so there's that need to do that. And we've got to be careful, even as you look at commentaries, it's amazing how many of them uh, from our academic seminaries are filled with higher criticism, uh, theistic evolution ideas, psychological nonsense. And sometimes I just really, I find personally, I like drinking at the old wells. 
give me ch mcintosh any day i just uh, i just find it so refreshing to my soul because it takes me to christ and that's where i need to be whereas a lot of these other ones are all in these arguments and stuff like that and it's just they're they're debating the philistines all the time instead of just getting this the pure water so we can drink it so wells ever in scripture especially genesis source of life and blessing and so the, the enemy naturally seeks to fill them with earth. That's what he wants to do. Isaac not only dug out the wells, but he called them by their old names. And I, I really like the old names, you know, the old biblical names, justification by faith, sanctification, propitiation, these great truths, these good old names, and, and even the old-fashioned names like Ebenezer. Oh, hitherto the Lord has helped us. Aren't you glad for this old truth? And it's just thrilling to the soul. And, and modernity tries to kind of neutralize all that stuff. And, and what a joy it is to discover these marvelous truths ourselves. So Isaac cleared them and he called them by their old names, their proper names, the names that they were given. And they're good names, they're biblical names that should never lose their effectiveness amongst God's people. And it's amazing, isn't it? Every We're constantly learning new technology and with new ideas and new, new vocabulary. Uh, like, for instance, Zoom. How many of you thought Zoom was anything but the noise that when you were a kid, you were playing with cars and you say Zoom, 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 right? I mean, but now it has a completely different meaning. We have learned a new word, right? Uh, we've learned the new technology. And, and so th there's no harm for somebody who's an unbeliever to learn about regeneration, justification, sanctification, propitiation. It won't kill them. They're constantly learning new things. And so don't dumb it down, right? Let's give it the right names, the biblical names. Anyway, it says in verse 19, Isaac's servants digged in the valley and found there a well of springing water. And so what we find he does uh, using his servants is he just quietly digs wells. And if you imagine this, that all th across the land, he's digging these wells. And what does that do? Well, it leaves behind refreshment and blessing, doesn't it? The more water sources you have, the more blessing there is. And so I believe that when we dig the old wells, you'll always leave behind a blessing. People are going to be blessed as you discover the great truth and you share them with others. You're going to, you're going to bring kind of freshness and vitality everywhere you go. You're going to bring a blessing. And that's what he does. Now, here's just an interesting thought as we look at these different wells that he's going to give names to because of the things that are going on around it. The very fact that the Holy Spirit lingers so lovingly over this section of the story means it must have something to teach us. And so we, we need to just pay attention to it. what is the Lord through the Spirit trying to teach us all these wells and the digging of them and the naming of them and all the rest of it. I mean, what does it matter that 4,000 years ago, a man called Isaac dug three comparatively insignificant wells in the corner of Canaan? Well, obviously, God, the Holy Spirit, figured it was significant, and we should pay attention to these three wells. And I want to suggest to you that the importance of the record is that it, it, it tells us the, the attitude of the Philistines to the word of God and to the things of Christ. And so what can we learn from this? So let's just notice, first of all, it says, I so was dig dwells, it was a well of springing water. And verse 20, the herdsmen of Gerar did strive with Isaac herdsmen, saying, the water is ours. And he called the name of the well Esek, because they strove with him. And it's true that the, the Philistines believe that the truth belongs to them. And so, you know, you go to liberal seminaries and they feel like they have a corner on the, on the word of God. And although they pervert it and all the rest of it, they, you know, and they strive with God's people over it, even though they really don't have a whole lot of interest uh, other than proving it wrong. And so uh, there's this, uh, Isaac, Isaac here stands for contention and they're, they're Philistines contending over the scriptures. Now, we're told we're to earnestly contend for the faith, which was once and for all delivered to the saints. But I suspect that Isaac in our story is a bit like us. Most of us 
don't like strife. Anybody particularly enjoy strife? I don't think any of us do, right? And so one of the things you find about Isaac is that, that he's, a, he's one of the most peaceable people in the Old Testament. And oftentimes he just moves on. He doesn't, he doesn't stay, he just moves on and he'll build another well. And so this is what he does. And so, but we, we're getting a glimpse at their response. They're contentious. Isaac, the peace-loving man, hated strife. And sometimes the most peaceable believer have strife forced upon them. And they have to, they find themselves having to contend for the faith. Uh, every truth uh, of the church has been bitterly assailed by the Philistines and its ranks. And so sometimes we just have to, we have to make a stand and we have to fight for truth, even though we don't like it. But the liberals, uh, they, they say, uh, the ritualists, all the different ones, they, they say the truth belongs to them. But what we learn here is that actually it belongs to, to God's Isaacs, not the worldly Philistines, those that love it, those that like it pure, those that dig deep. That's who the truth belongs to. And so he says he digged another well and strove for, and they strove for that also. And he called the name of it Sitna. Sitna is a very interesting uh, term. Uh, if Esek, Esek signified contention, um, this well means contempt. And they digged another well and strove for that also, called it Sitna. And the word has the idea of hatred and comes from a Hebrew root word, meaning to lie in wait as an adversary. Now, it's interesting, this Hebrew root word from which Sitna comes, another name comes that you'll be very well familiar with, the name Satan. Sitna, Satan. Can you see a bit of a similarity here? Same Hebrew root word. And so what we could say is actually behind the Philistines' hostility is none other than the adversary himself. And we have to keep reminding ourselves, liberal theologians are not our enemy. They're victims of the enemy. They have been deceived. Liberal politicians who want to take us to the left and embrace Marxist philosophies. They're not the enemy. They're victims of the enemy. They have been duped by the evil one. And it's good to remember that, that they're, they're deceived. The deceiver has captured their hearts and minds. And the only way that we're going to have minds that are what they ought to be is by renewing our minds with the word of God. And it's only when we renew our minds, we see that these people really behind them is another enemy, an adversary that hates the truth, especially the truth of Christ and him crucified and the whole message, the core message of Christianity, that pure living water that can change men's life. There's a hatred to that. And so once again, he removed from thence, verse 22, and digged another well. And for that, they strove not. So eventually, they, they're not fighting anymore. They're just indifferent. They've just left him to himself. And uh, he's dug another well, and he calls it Rehoboth, or Rehoboth. And uh, he says, because the Lord has made room for us, and we shall be fruitful in the land. And it's only when he has come out from them and been separate from them that he enjoys peace striving there's contention well but when he pulls away from them then he enjoys peace and sometimes um you know when you're involved in conflict spiritually with philistines the only way you'll ever enjoy peace is coming out from among them and being separate and that's what he does and he says the lord has found room for us and uh, so here he is in a place where he can enjoy the blessing. And then it says he went from there to Beersheba. And the Lord appeared to him the same night and said, I am the God of Abraham, thy father. Fear not, for I am with thee and will bless thee and multiply thy seed for my servant Abraham's sake. And he built an altar there and called upon the name of the Lord and pitched his tent there. And there Isaac's servants digged the well. So after having separated himself from the Philistines, from, if you like, the religious world of profession, he's separated from this. He goes to Beersheba, which is the well of the oath. It's, uh, it's where Abraham 
uh, the Lord had uh, appeared to Abraham in Genesis chapter 21. And immediately that same night, the Lord, just as he'd appeared to Abraham, appears to him. And it says he told him some things that night which were greatly significant and that would have a, an amazing impact uh, on his life. And so what was he told that night? Um, well, <clears throat> at this place called the Well of the Oath, where he's separated from his enemies and God appears to him, the Lord tells him several things. First of all, he says, I am the God of thy father, Abraham. So <clears throat> the Lord is his, um, the same God that appeared to Abraham now appears to him. So <clears throat> I am uh, the Lord. Let me just get it again. I am, it says unto him the same night, I am the, the God of Abraham, thy father. And so he appears to him in a very personal way. I'm God of your father, Abraham. It's the same person that appeared to Abraham, appears to him. So he, so he gets a revelation of the Lord's person, a very clear revelation of the God that appeared to his father. And then he says, for I am with thee. And so he has this promise of God's protection, that God is with him. And he says, and will bless thee. He has a promise of the Lord's provision. So he's got the Lord's person. He's the God of his father, Abraham, has appeared to him. Uh, he's with him. He's got the promise uh, of his protection. Uh, God is with him. He's going to look after him. He's promise of God's provision. I will bless thee. And then he has the final promise uh, of, <clears throat> of the fact that he would be greatly blessed. Uh, and he says, I will multiply thy seed for my servant Abraham's sake. And so the Lord's promise uh, that he's going to be multiplied. What more could a man want, really, than knowing the Lord's presence, uh, knowing his protection, uh, knowing his provision, and, and knowing that his promises will be fulfilled in his life? And so this separation from the Philistines was a tremendous blessing to him. And so it says he built there an altar. So the result of it was worship, right? He built an altar. And then it says he pitched his tent, pilgrim life this is verse 25 he built an altar there called on the name of the lord i guess that would be prayer communion worship communion pitched his tent living as a pilgrim and and it says there he dig the well because he's the man of the wells and what else is he going to do he's going to dig a well once again and and so what we find here is the the man of the wells becomes an effective worshiper in a pilgrim i find that very interesting see i believe that if we're digging deep digging a, 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 a fresh the truth getting rid of all the clutter of the tradition and finding the pure living water of the word that takes us to the person of christ what will that produce in our lives well genuine worship it will also cause us to, as the more we understand the loveliness of the Lord Jesus, to want to live here as a stranger and a pilgrim. And it will also want us to dig even deeper and have new wells where we're digging deep to grasp the old truth afresh for our lives. So that's exactly what happens with Isaac. He, all of these things occur to this man of the wells. And so, again, could we encourage one another? in the days where the philistines are just as active as they've ever been they want to block access to the wells and often today i want to suggest to you that one of the main ways they do it is by distraction not so much just dirt but distraction they want to distract your mind and there's never been a more distracted generation than this generation and that's why it's very difficult for us to dig the wells again, dig the old wells. And so I want to encourage us to dig in the old wells, to, to read the scriptures, to meditate upon them, to see the loveliness of Christ there. And I was talking about Mr. McIntosh, and I mentioned, uh, you know, as an example of the, those waters years and years ago, this would be back in 1984. I had to read as an assignment notes on the Pentateuch. I have no idea about who this man was, 
where he hung his hat. I didn't know anything about him. It was a Bible school requirement. We had to read this book. And I remember reading it and being so taken by the person of Christ, like never before, that I kept having to put the book down and worship. And I thought, whoever this man is, and wherever he hangs his hat, this is where I need to be. And part of the reason that I'm in fellowship amongst the assemblies of God's people today is because I enjoyed the wells that were pure and took me to the person of Christ. It made a worshiper out of me. It also made a stranger and a pilgrim out of me. <laughs> but it was a wonderful experience. And I want to encourage all of us to dig again those wells and find refreshment for our souls. You know, it's interesting. I said we'd finish at John 7, and we will. Let's go back to John 7. The context of John 7, where the Lord says, if anyone thirsts, is the eighth day of the Feast of Tabernacle. They had just had a week of religion. Religion on steroids. Because, you know, the Jews... The feasts were originally the feasts of Jehovah, but they become the feast of the Jews. And they what they'd done is like good old Philistines, they'd they'd added lots of traditions. And so part of the thing was they'd carry this big uh, water thing and they'd pour it out, you know, in the temple courts. They'd have a big big candelabra and all the rest of it, trying to recreate the reality of the of God's provision in the wilderness. And so after this whole week of religious ceremony, the Lord says this, is anybody still thirsty? And of course they were, because it didn't satisfy. Philistine religion can never satisfy. It's empty. It's dirty. It's defiling. It's not the pure living water. And he says, if anybody's thirsty, let him come to me. <laughs> you see, the one who the scriptures and the spirit would direct you to is him. Let him come to me and drink. And so he says, he that believes on me, which is the whole purpose of the scriptures and the spirit, so that we believe on the Lord Jesus, as the scriptures said, out of his innermost being will flow rivers of living water. Yeah, he, he'll not have empty religion. He'll get the spirit, <laughs> the spirit in overflowing abundance. He says, this spake of the spirit, which they that believe on him should receive. The Holy Ghost was not yet given, but that Jesus was not yet glorified. And they themselves, out of their innermost being, rivers of living water, they'll become a refreshment to others too. Not only they, will they have this well of water bubbling up within them, but it will flow out and impact others. And so religion can't produce it. Philistine religion, all it can do is fill the wells with dirt but jesus says if anybody's thirsty come to me so may the lord encourage us to dig again the wells <laughs> that our fathers have dug and to find it for ourselves fresh and pure and clean and allow it to make a worshiper and a pilgrim out of us may god encourage us with these thoughts let's pray our oh, Father, we're, we're thankful for this, this story over 4,000 years old. And yet the Holy Spirit has sought fit to leave it there in Scripture to instruct us on how important it is to drink deeply at the wells. Father, we're thankful for the, the water of the Word. We're thankful for the Holy Spirit who... Again, both together lead us to understand the loveliness of the person of the Lord Jesus. Thank you for bringing us to that place. And Lord, we would not assume that in all of our assemblies, everyone is truly a child of God. And Lord, we pray again that you would expose the Philistines amongst us, the tares, the ones that are not real, uh, that don't find great satisfaction in the things that satisfy the heart of the true believer, have really no appetite. They want to be entertained. They want fun and games. They don't want the truth of the word of God in its undiluted, pure form. Lord, root them out. And Lord, save them. That's what we'd love to see. We'd love to see them saved. But Lord, help us to be conscious of the fact 
that even even amongst our own assemblies there are those that we wonder are they the real deal lord we pray it might be so but lord we pray that you'd expose any that are false and we'll give thee the glory in jesus name amen